Hi, uh, good evening to you all. Um, it's a, could be a perfect beginning to this weekend, last weekend of September. It's less than two months to go for the US elections and we have a top US diplomat here today to discuss the uh, foreign policy priorities of both the presidential nominees, uh, Barack Obama and Romney. And nobody could better do that than Ambassador Blackwell. Uh, we have Ambassador Shamsharan, uh, former Indian Foreign Secretary, uh, to chair the session. Uh, ambassador Sharan needs no introduction, uh, having served as India's ambassador to Indonesia, Nepal, uh, Mauritius, uh, and is currently with the uh, RIS. And uh, Ambassador Blackwell, who you all know, who is the Council of Foreign Relations now, has been a former US ambassador here. Uh, I would not take much time and uh, leave the floor to Ambassador Sharan uh, to get going. Thanks. Ambassador Blackwell, um, India Aspen Group Director Kiran, a distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome in our midst uh, Ambassador Robert Blackwell, who has been uh, the U.S. Ambassador uh, to India, but more than that, has been very closely associated with the uh, kind of uh, transformation that has uh, taken place in India-US relations over the last uh, uh, 10 years or more. Um, Ambassador Blackwell, um, of course, uh, has uh, uh, been with the Republican uh, Party and has been uh, an advisor to uh, Republican uh, presidents. Uh, of course, most recently, President uh, Bush uh, is today also uh, I have no doubt, and it is an advisor to the uh, Republican Party nominee for the presidency, U.S. presidency. And um, what is uh, perhaps a matter of some uh, assurance uh, to India is that, uh, uh, number one, there appears to be, at least on the issue of relations with India, uh, the two contending parties appear to have a fair degree of convergence. That. Uh, India-US relations are good for the United States. Uh, and I have no doubt that uh, Ambassador Blackwell himself uh, would have been contributing very strongly to that particular uh, sentiment amongst uh, the two parties. Um, even though uh, we have uh, a dem democratic administration right now, but uh, I am personally aware of the fact that how uh, Ambassador Blackwell's uh, advice on relations with India have always been valued. Uh, not just by uh, the Republican Party, but uh, by the current uh, administration. Uh, so we are very privileged to have him uh, in our midst. Uh, it would be difficult to find another, uh, another analyst with a kind of uh, insights into the U.S. political system, the dynamics uh, that uh, we see at play uh, in the run-up to the uh, presidential elections. Uh, it may be difficult to see who will finally win the elections, but uh, I'm certain that uh, uh, at the end of uh, Bob's uh, presentation, we would have a, a much better idea of where we stand uh, with respect to the chances for the election of the two candidates, but much more, uh, what will be the shape of uh, U.S. foreign policy, in particular uh, policy towards India, uh, if one or the other becomes president? Uh, Bob, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to be uh, here again in Mother India, and I especially uh, appreciate my close friends at the Aspen Institute India for inviting me to speak on this important subject. Uh, no, I am not involved uh, with uh, the campaign. Uh, I uh, uh, did uh, three presidential campaigns uh, myself uh, up close, and I think uh, that was enough. So I'm not involved uh, with the campaign. Um, I, of course, have my preference uh, 
as most Americans do by now, of who I think would be the best next American president. But I'm not going to burden you with that preference uh, today. Um, rather, I want to try in as analytical way as I can to identify the differences uh, between the two candidates on the major issues that face the United States. I'm going to have to do that given time constraints in uh, bold strokes. Uh, there will be too little nuance, but um, I think you'll get the idea. Um, so uh, I want to reassure you all that I'm not going to turn this event into a presidential campaign event, and none of you will be asked to write campaign checks at the end. Let me begin with some general points on campaign rhetoric, on continuity in U.S. foreign policy, and on the intrusion of the world into the Oval Office. Uh, then I'll get into the more specific issues that divide uh, the uh, candidates. As I indicated earlier, I was uh, deeply involved in three presidential campaigns, 1992, 2000, and 2004. Uh, and this won't come as a surprise to uh, those of you who have been in the political life of democratic India, but when you're in a campaign, you can find nothing to say good about your opponent's policies, and your opponent can find nothing good to say about your critiques of your opponent's policy. That's the nature of politics. So uh, driven by the 24-hour uh, cable news cycle, you will see day after day uh, dramatic differences uh, between the two candidates. Indeed, one has the impression that if one candidate were to say that they very much liked chocolate chip cookies, the other would feel compelled to say that peanut butter cookies are much, much better than chocolate chip cookies. So uh, this is just to say that campaign rhetoric and governance are not the same thing. And indeed, uh, Having that as context, uh, I believe there will be far more continuity in American policy than this rhetoric suggests. Uh, just to give you a few examples of continuity and uh, to some degree perhaps surprises in uh, that domain. Uh, for example, counterterrorism, I think that few who watched uh, the Obama campaign uh, in 2008 would have guessed that uh, President Obama would have prosecuted the war against terror as ruthlessly as George W. Bush did, and indeed with respect to the drones uh, attacks in Pakistan and elsewhere, actually escalated and accelerated that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, attack against uh, terror. So uh, I think uh, there was a continuity there one might not have uh, uh, expected. Um, the uh, president's, I think, uh, approach to Europe is not very different than George W. Bush's approach. And uh, on China, after, uh, if I may say, a period of some effervescence at the beginning of the administration, uh, I believe that President Obama's current views on China are not very different than George W. Bush's, witness the pivot to Asia and so forth. So there are these continuities which uh, often trump uh, campaign rhetoric. Uh, and finally, the world will intrude on the next president and his approach to foreign policy in ways that will uh, uh, surprise us, maybe even astound us. Of course, the most dramatic example of that uh, is the 9-11 attack. I uh, 
in the campaign tra transition after George W. Bush uh, uh, won the election with one of my colleagues wrote the basic uh, proposed approach to foreign policy for the first year of uh, the George W. Bush administration. And I think it's accurate to say it had a rather Nixon Kissingerian approach to it. Uh, and uh, until the 11th of September uh, 2001, it was followed. And then there was the attack, and everything changed. Um, not anticipated, of, of course. Uh, if I can give you another example, I was um, also in uh, George H. W. Bush's uh, administration, Papa Bush. And again, when he took office, nobody imagined that uh, by the end of uh, his term of office, uh, Eastern Europe would be liberated, Germany would be unified within NATO, and so forth. Again, the world intruded. Uh, to go back a little further, Jimmy Carter had a vision of much less American activism in the world, except perhaps in the human rights dimension, but the Iranian revolution and the Soviet invasion of uh, Afghanistan wrecked that. Uh, so, and then of course the current Arab uprising, who anticipated it, who uh, is brave enough to say uh, the directions it will go uh, in the next four years. So the question I raise for us is, how will the world intrude into the four-year term of the next president? What tactical and strategic surprises await the winner of this election? Your guess is as good as mine, but I can say with some confidence that there will be such surprises in the next four years with which the next president will have to cope. Now, let me begin with uh, the strategic approaches of the two presidents, and then I'll get into in individual, two presidential candidates, and then I'll get into the individual issues. President Obama's uh, views are uh, not uh, a secret. He's been best described, and I think this is basically fair and widely held, uh, based on his four years of policy making as a liberal internationalist. Uh, he's characterized by a commitment to a rules-based international system with strong multilateral organizations witnesses use of the UN as an instrument of US policy, and by a reluctance to act unilaterally in international affairs. The 2011 Libyan intervention is a case in point. He supported, the president supported the use of military force to save lives, but probably would not have done so without the endorsement of the Arab League and UN Security Council authorization. And he did, uh, as you know, uh, in using US military force, used it in a restrained way uh, as that uh, Libyan combat proceeded. Uh, now, uh, George Friedman, the American strategist, uh, in examining uh, the Obama approach, uh, argues that, therefore, he is less devoted to the balance of power as an animating concept in international relations than earlier American presidents. Uh, and uh, that uh, instead of the United States being decisive in the application of the balance of power, uh, President Obama's efforts have been away from active balancing, as uh, Friedman puts it, and toward uh, more use of regional organizations and regional powers um, instead. Uh, Syria perhaps highlights this, uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon. Um, the president may uh, believe, and I think many do, that uh, the survival of Assad and his regime would unbalance the region 
but notice uh, Turkey's leading role in dealing with the uh, uh, Syrian uh, uh, tragedy. And the president's uh, opposition to intervention except through some covert action. So um, I think fair-minded people, uh, uh, some of them would argue that uh, this is the right approach to the current post-Cold War situation because uh, U.S. intervention sometimes is more likely to animate, to generate anti-American coalitions and precisely the kinds of threats the United States fears uh, than otherwise. So that's President Obama. Uh, Governor Romney, I think, uh, takes uh, a traditional Republican view that uh, the most important uh, decisive uh, element in America's conduct of its international relations is to ensure a balance of power exists uh, in the international system. Uh, he also, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, disagrees with the president's apparent view that there's no serious Eurasian hegemonic threat to worry about. In addition, and I'll say a little bit more about this as well, uh, as I think most of you know, Romney has cited the reemergence of Russia as a potential threat to American interests uh, that requires U.S. action on a substantial scale. Uh, and the rise of Chinese power seems more worrisome to Romney than to Obama. I think it's also true that Romney appears to be less sensitive to global opinion than Obama. He argues that Obama, Romney argues Obama's uh, efforts have failed to sway global opinion in any decisive way, despite great expectations around the world for an Obama presidency. Um, so in Romney's view, this is a foolish task, that is to try to say, satisfy the wishes of the world, not least because uh, they're so contradictory. The president, on the other hand, uh, is convinced, it seems, that over the long run, it matters what the world thinks about the United States and its policies. Next, American leadership. This is always an issue in all of our presidential campaigns, and it's been one of the most salient issues in this campaign. It centers often on a comment uh, by an uh, administration policymaker several months ago uh, a um, background comment, not so identified, uh, that in some instances it is better for the United States to, quote, lead from behind, unquote. This was a defense of the Libya policy when the United States was not in the forefront of uh, the military action in the second half of that episode. Uh, Romney, uh, in a recent speech, says Obama has failed to lead in dealings with other nations. He has given trust where it's not earned, insult where it's not deserved, and a policy, a policy, apology, sorry, and apology where it's not due. Uh, Senator John McCain, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, have reinforced that message. Now, the Obama campaign, of course, rejects all of that criticism, and. Uh, says that uh, if America seeks to lead in that way in the current era, in the current era, it'll have two consequences. One, there'll be a lot of free riders in the international system who'll be happy to let the United States uh, bear the brunt, but also that in the current system, most countries, unlike in the Cold War, um, want uh, to feel as if they're a part of American decision-making and not an object of American decision-making. Uh, in, uh, in a recent uh, interview, as President Obama, this in the last few days, was meeting, uh, was giving a speech at the United Nations in response to this critique of his leadership, 
uh, President Obama said, quote, if Governor Romney is suggesting that we should start another war, he should say so, unquote. Now, uh, the individual issues. Afghanistan. Um, and let me say that as I go through this, uh, you're going to perhaps recognize uh, the connection between the policies that the candidates take and the current views of the American people. Uh, because, of course, they're running for office. So they uh, presumably wish to cultivate uh, the goodwill of the voter, and you'll see that in some of these. For example, both uh, President uh, Obama and Governor Romney support NATO's plan to withdraw co U.S. combat forces from Afghanistan by the end of 2014. And this is uh, deeply responsive to the American people's overwhelming wish that the United States leave Afghanistan. And all the polling now shows it's 80% or so that the American people are ready to end this now 10-year, 11-year uh, uh, commitment. But there is uh, perhaps a, a serious difference, um, and that is uh, the president uh, will continue reducing U.S. forces gradually up to 2014, um, and therefore the U.S. combat capability uh, before that will be diminished and diminished and diminished, while Governor Romney has said that he'll follow the advice of U.S. generals in this regard, and um, he would probably recommend, as the generals do, that uh, the current force of 68,000 in Afghanistan be maintained through all of next year and certainly through the uh, spring-summer fighting season next year. So that's a substantial uh, difference. Uh, the Middle East. Uh, well, let me start with a New York Times editorial. The president has learned over almost two years of political turmoil in the Arab world Bold words and support for democratic aspirations are not enough to engender goodwill in this region. Um, and uh, the uh, critique by Governor uh, Romney is uh, that uh, it has been the weakness of American policy in the Middle East, uh, as manifested through the four Obama years, that's had a, a substantial effect on uh, these last uh, several weeks in the Middle East, in uh, Libya, in Egypt, and so forth. Indeed, uh, Governor Romney goes so far as to say that if he had been president, if he had been president, the attack in Benghazi and uh, the uh, riots in Cairo would not have happened. Uh, the uh, uh, it was American weakness that caused that. Uh, the Obama campaign responds that this is a simple-minded way of seeing this, that this phenomenon is largely due to uh, internal uh, reasons, and no American president, no matter what his policies, uh, could change those internal domestic uh, factors. Iran. Here's an area which, where there's perhaps uh, the greatest difference that's consequential to India, uh, and uh, it has to do not with uh, saying that uh, Iran must not acquire a nuclear weapon. Both campaigns say that, and both have indicated, Governor Romney somewhat more explicitly, that they would use force as a last resort to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. But there is a very significant difference. Obama's policy is that uh, he wishes to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And uh, Romney says he wants to prevent Iran from acquiring the capability 
to, uh, to build a bomb. And of course, those are very different ideas. The first saying, uh, well, we're going to uh, use force if they make a decision to weaponize depends on the ability of the United States intelligence community to know they've made such a decision. And the preoccupation with capability probably brings the timeline forward uh, when the use of force uh, might be an appropriate action by the United States. Uh, indeed, um, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday that they already have the capability to produce nuclear weapons. Maybe not the decision, but the capability. So um, it uh, appears that uh, uh, President uh, Obama is willing to give the negotiating process, which, as you know, in three meetings has produced zero, longer to try to have a breakthrough than uh, Governor Romney might do. Syria. Again, reflecting the views of the American people, there's been uh, caution by both candidates regarding uh, U.S. Uh, mili direct military intervention in uh, Syria. Uh, there are many in both parties who favor U.S. military intervention in Syria, both Republicans and Democrats, beginning with perhaps a no-fly zone to pr pr uh, protect civilians and so forth. But uh, neither of the two candidates has endorsed that idea, and I think perhaps partially because uh, the American people are tired of wars. And to start another one, uh, which is what would be uh, fighting the uh, Syrian armed forces, is not popular as an idea in the United States. Iraq, they mostly argue not about the future, but about the past. Uh, that is to say, uh, President Obama regards it as one of the successes of his administration uh, to have the total, to see the total withdrawal of U.S. forces, military forces from Iraq occur. He campaigned on that basis in 2008 and delivered on his promise. Uh, the Republicans uh, say that uh, to withdraw all military forces from Iran was a, from Iraq was a mistake, and that it ensured uh, that Iran would be by far the most influential foreign power in Iraq and therefore uh, uh, President Obama shouldn't have pursued that policy. But as I say, that's mostly an argument about the past. Israel-Palestine, um, well, as you know, uh, the current negotiation is, is dead in the water. Uh, the president entered office with a conviction that he wanted to make this a major element in his policy. He tried for two years uh, did not succeed, uh, and uh, I think myself from reading everything I can that uh, if he's elected, he's likely to try again. Uh, that contrasts, I think, quite substantially with Governor Romney, who uh, I think is much less likely to be active uh, with respect to the Israel-Palestinian issue. China. Um, again, if you think of past campaigns, it's sometimes difficult to anticipate what a president will do with China from the campaign rhetoric. I remind you that after Tiananmen, uh, uh, Bill Clinton in his campaign called the Chinese leadership the, the butchers of Beijing in his, uh, in his uh, campaign rhetoric and then pursued uh, a policy toward China that wasn't very different than all of its predecessors. Uh, uh, the other uh, issue uh, China arises usually in American politics is on the economic side, and this is not different this time. Uh, here is a uh, Romney ad, which Americans are seeing. Quote, China is stealing American ideas and technology, everything from commuter, computers to fighter jets, Seven times Obama could have taken action to stop this. Seven times he said no. His policies cost us two million jobs. Obama has 
has had years to stand up to China. He has not done so. We can't afford four more years. I think it's a critique of, uh, by the Romney campaign. Uh, but the Republicans go further, and I just want to read you from the platform that was adopted in Tampa, the Republican uh, 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 platform. Uh, and as you know, Governor Romney said on his first day in office he was going to uh, uh, charge China with currency manipulation. But more broadly, uh, here's uh, the platform. Mitt Romney will implement a strategy that makes the path of regional hegemony for China far more costly than the alternative path of becoming a responsible partner in the international system. Uh, and uh, he goes on to say, uh, the United States should expand its naval presence in the Western Pacific, of course, of course something the Obama administration has announced it is doing. Uh, so, um, and the Obama reaction to this is, it's too dangerous to be confrontational with China in that way that Romney suggests, that um, there's virtually no country in Asia which would find that uh, appealing, such a, a direct confrontation uh, with uh, Beijing. Russia, Governor Romney has called Russia uh, America's uh, most important uh, strategic threat. Um, Obama's reaction to that was a question, doesn't Governor Romney know the Cold War is over? But um, in any case, the reset policy of President Obama has been uh, deeply criticized by uh, the Romney campaign. Um, and uh, here's another phrase from the uh, Republican platform. Uh, the uh, suppression of opposition parties, this is by the Russian government, the press, the institution of civil society, the unprovoked invasion of the Republic of Georgia, the alignment with tyrants in the Middle East, the bullying their neighbors while protecting the last Stalinist regime in Belarus, all this is, uh, are the fruits of the reset policy of President Obama. Um, and then there is nuclear arms control. Uh, the uh, president, of course, worked very hard and succeeded in getting the last nu uh, strategic nuclear weapon, so-called New START Treaty, through the Senate. Uh, Governor Romney opposed that treaty and um, uh, does to this day. Uh, finally, I think after the election, uh, there will be a major effort if President Obama is elected to try to reach some agreement with Moscow on missile defense. Uh, it seems unlikely that uh, Governor Romney would seek to do so. On trade, uh, it's striking that uh, the uh, Obama administration has initiated no new trade agreements, although it finished a few from uh, the George W. Bush uh, 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 period. Uh, I think. Uh, the uh, uh, future of trade agreements, such trade agreements will depend a lot on the American economy. Military spending, uh, uh, Governor Romney has accused the president of reckless defense cuts and has said he will substantially increase the defense budget. Uh, the, the, uh, the Obama campaign has said this is mindless uh, spending with no strategic concept behind it. And then uh, some analysts wonder, in any case, where the money is going to be coming from to increase the defense budget given America's current uh, economic difficulties. Pakistan, I don't think there'll be very much difference in the two uh, uh, potential administrations with respect to Pakistan. Uh, if I can sum it up like this, Pakistan today has almost no friends in Washington on either side of the aisle. You may think that's good, you may think that's unfortunate, but I think it is a statement of fact. Now, India, and I will uh, just uh, 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 emphasize what our chairman did. Uh, the American political elite uh, strongly supports, with virtually no exceptions, uh, and strategic elite, with virtually no exceptions, 
an ever stronger U.S.-India strategic partnership. Not alliance, of course, but partnership, and to make it ever more muscular and substantive. So there's no argument in uh, the campaign about that. Um, and uh, India, the U.S.-India relationship, has not figured in any serious way in the campaign at all, which shows, I think, this continuity of uh, policy through administrations that our chairman mentioned. So ha what, what happens in the next administration with respect to the U.S.-India relationship is not that. Rather, uh, there are two other fundamental questions which uh, I think will define uh, the, what happens on the American side to the U.S.-India relationship in the next four years. The first is, what priority is it given by the next administration? That's question one. And question two, which is related, what else will be happening in the world which will fill up the space of American policymakers? And uh, if you look at the rest of the world uh, from the uh, optic of Washington, it appears there'll be plenty to fill up that space and uh, to uh, compel the interest, time, and resources of the United States. Uh, and in that regard, one last point, of course, it will be pertinent how India fits into the next administration's view of the problem. Does India have a role to play with the United States in trying to solve these problems? or not. Um, but I think it is fair to say uh, that uh, there's going to be plenty to occupy the next president uh, given uh, the events around the world and especially in the Middle East. One last point as I conclude. Uh, many in this audience, I see friends here, including our distinguished chairman, have struggled, as I have, with the challenges of bureaucratic politics within government. So I want to make this final point. As important as everything I've said earlier regarding differences between the two candidates on foreign policy, putting these policy and ideological differences aside, the success of the next president will be uh, highly influenced, if not determined, by the administration's simple competence in a day-to-day -day sense. And the practitioners who are here, foreign policy practitioners, will know that although presidents can have visions and presidents have, and have policies, uh, better for better or worse, it matters a lot the quality of competence that is demonstrated by an administration. And so the day-to-day -day management of uh, America's foreign uh, affairs will be a decisive factor in the next four years. Um, will it, the next administration, be competent and above the threshold uh, on, the, on the part of uh, interested expert observers or not? That remains to be seen. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, I just, uh, to just set, set the ball rolling with regard to questions and answers, I'm afraid we don't have much time, so I'll just restrict myself to a very, uh, maybe a comment rather than a question. Uh, certainly it seemed to me uh, during the time that we were negotiating the uh, Indo-US Civil Nuclear Agreement uh, that uh, at various critical points, the personality of the president himself and his political commitment to 
India-U.S. relations uh, made, in fact, a lot of difference. Uh, in particularly overcoming some of the bureaucratic, uh, the establishment, uh, I wouldn't say obstruction, but rigidities in the establishment. Um, and uh, certainly towards the early part of the Obama administration, there seemed to be a perception that that kind of political commitment at that poli high political level uh, was perhaps uh, missing during those uh, early, early months. Um, in, in, in your sense, um, do you see Romney as a Bush-like, likely Bush-like figure? In terms of um, you know that uh, that uh, more more personal involvement in um, say in Indo-U.S. relations. Well, um, again, it's it's hard to know as I tried to say earlier, and um, I would remind us all that Senator Obama opposed the U.S.-India nuclear deal, and uh, of of course then his administration worked uh, uh, on it. Um, I don't think that one can replicate the personal commitment um, of uh, George W. Bush to the U.S.-India relationship, whoever's the next president. Um, he, for reasons I've written about this elsewhere, uh, became convinced that one of the most important of his administration goals was transforming the relationship. He did it from the very beginning and that animated uh, through uh, his administration, through the eight years. And so I just think there's no particular reason why Governor Romney would have that same passion, I think I can even use the word passion, about the U.S.-India uh, relationship. Um, so I doubt it, um, but there is also uh, uh, this point as uh, the transformation was going on, uh, the president, uh, wa President Bush, uh, was deeply, deeply, deeply involved in foreign affairs um, because of the two wars. And I think that uh, pushed domestic issues largely aside uh, in his administration and gave more space to uh, the U.S.-India relationship. Um, it's uh, very, very important to note that uh, both these candidates believe that America's greatest challenges in the next four years are domestic, are domestic, not international, and that uh, dealing with America's domestic economic problems is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth priority of the next administration. Now, the world may intervene, as I said earlier, but uh, again, uh, if that is the case, it will reduce the space for foreign policy of any kind in the administration. I mean, at the top of the kind you asked, uh, uh, Sham, and um, and that would have its implications for the U.S.-India relationship. Thank you. Uh, what uh, I think I will do is, uh, since we have a limited amount of time available, uh, perhaps take uh, about four or five questions and then request uh, Bob to uh, respond uh, uh, in, in his uh, closing, closing remarks. Uh, yes, please. Please identify yourself and uh, please make your uh, question as brief as possible. I'm General. Uh, firstly, welcome back and we're lucky we're able to welcome you back so frequently. I'm General Chopra, a veteran of four wars. I have two observations, Ambassador. You might like to comment on them. I'm with you on the continuity aspect of Afghanistan, but I want to know from you between the two presidents, with the proportional decrease of troops in Afghanistan, Romney wants 68, Obama wants to reduce them, there is going to be a proportional increase in the activities of the Taliban and the terrorists over there. Do you think with the situation getting very, very bad, Obama, if he becomes president, will change his mind, one. Number two, China, you use the word pivot, linchpin pivot, you already have 60% of the armada of the Americans in the South China Sea eventually. If Romney comes in, since he wants to assert the balance of power, how much more can he increase the American presence in this area? And to very short things, is anybody going to do anything about anti-Americanism that is spreading, especially in the Muslim world? And lastly, does the bearing 
the, I'm very, doing very quickly. Does the first or second term have a bearing on the decisions that the two presidents make? Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, after listening to you about the continuities, are there really any ideological differences between the two presidential candidates or even the parties? particularly when it comes to dealing with the domestic priorities and how the foreign policy of U.S. towards India will influence the nuclear policy, the jobs, and FDI. Three issues which are dominating our thinking right now. Ambassador, uh, every president has uh, certain policies, but he can only implement them if he has the Congress with, with them, right? So uh, do you think uh, with the House already, with the Republicans, uh, what kind of pattern of voting would be impacted this year uh, as uh, we go in for presidential election? Because one third of the Senate and the entire House is again up for election. You said that, um, you yeah, John Elliott. You say you said that um, uh, how, but whichever whoever wins would regard India would depend on the contribution that India could make to help solving problems. Is that significant? Are there any areas where real help would be given? Yes, the last question. Yeah, Pastor. The regarding outsourcing, India is the major country will be affected. And Indian population is in favor of Obama. How do you think this is going to affect? Uh, our Indian population in U.S. is very much in favor of Obama. Yes. They are keen supporting. Indian public in India is very much in favor of Obama. Will that affect outsourcing? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and I will I'll have to be get, given the time uh, fairly brief uh, to 10 minutes. Okay, first, Afghanistan. I think the question was not about the two presidents, but the effect of the U.S. policy on Afghanistan. Um, so I think I won't address that. I'm trying to use, I have very strong views on that matter, but this is uh, not the subject of my uh, talk today. Um, I will say, though, in Afghanistan, and I got this question um, in another way later, um, well, in the same context, is it likely that if things go bad in Afghanistan that uh, the president, this president, if he's reelected, will change his mind? I think there's very little chance of that, of him changing his mind. He's made a commitment to the American people uh, that uh, our combat uh, mission ends in 2014. I do not believe he will go back to the American people and say, I've changed my mind. The war is now deeply unpopular in the United States, and the view of the American people, I think, is mostly if 12 years isn't enough, 13, 14, 15, 20, 40 isn't going to be enough. So I don't think he's going to change his mind. It's perhaps somewhat harder uh, to, uh, to guess about a Romney administration, but I, I think the president, if it were uh, President Romney, uh, will be affected by this American public opinion. Ronan knows this very well. Uh, and uh, uh, so for him in the campaign to say, as he said, that he supports the 2014 withdrawal date, and then to become president and say, well, I've changed my mind. I, I, I don't think so, and I think India just has to accept, it may regret, but it just has to accept that the United States role in Afghanistan is going to uh, diminish dramatically. The question is, what will be the residual force left there after 2014? What will be its size and its mission, drones and, um, and special forces and air and so forth? But I think uh, the issue has been decided about the American uh, withdrawal. Uh, what about uh, 
na U.S. naval deployments um, in Asia. And as you said, Secretary Panetta said in Singapore that we were going to shift our resources. Of course, that is about a 10-year process of su supporting uh, the resources, Gov uh, the, the ships. Governor Romney uh, advocates a substantial increase in the size of the U.S. Navy. But again, the issue of where the money is going to come from is uh, going to face uh, him if he's elected. What to do about anti-Americanism in the Middle East uh, among the Muslim? You got me. I don't have any. Uh, I don't think that uh, governments can be uh, very, uh, the U.S. government can, be, uh, can have much effect on that. I mean, after all, if you read uh, President Obama's Cairo speech, the beginning of his administration, uh, what could have been a more forthcoming uh, speech on behalf of, of uh, the Middle East Arabs' place in the world, uh, uh, his support for pluralism, democracy in the Middle East, and so forth, and then his reaction uh, in uh, the early months of the Arab Revolt, his uh, statement on the phone to President Mubarak that he had to leave, and so forth. and. So uh, here's what I would say about that, which is it's difficult to know how substantial this anti-Americanism is in the public at large. But it's certainly felt by radical elements, for sure, and they take advantage of, uh, of uh, situations to do uh, what they did, the terrorist act in uh, Benghazi and the uh, riots in Cairo. But I think Whoever is the next president is going to have an enormous challenge in dealing with the turbulence of the Middle East, an enormous challenge. And uh, we can all list why that's so, but if you take all of that, all of these factors that we already know, and you add to that either an American or an Israeli military attack on Iran, then imagine uh, the effect of that. And the next American president, I think, will have to, <clears throat> unless negotiations uh, are uh, successful, and as I say, they've gotten nowhere so far, unless negotiations are successful, uh, both candidates have uh, one explicitly, one implicitly, but I think not very much difference between the two, said they'll use military force to stop the Iranian nuclear program. And so unless there's a breakthrough in the... Uh, negotiation, expect a war. And it won't be a short war. Uh, it, uh, it's likely to be quite a prolonged war. And it's a war that has, it seems to me, but our chairman and others in the room would, would have a better view, of substantial strategic significance to India if there's a long war in the Middle East between the United States and Iran. Uh, because it won't be confined to the Middle East. So I think if you look around the world, you have the rise of Chinese power, which in the long term is, in my judgment, the biggest challenge to the United States over the long term. I mean decades. But in the next four years, uh, the president is going to be extremely challenged by, to try to deal with this Middle East. Okay, uh, are there ideological differences? I'll just say, and I want to confine myself just to the domestic side. Uh, there are big ideological differences on the domestic side. So, and, and it has to do with the best way to revive the American economy. Republican ideology says lower taxes and you will uh, generate America's um, instinctive entrepreneurism uh, and that will stimulate uh, economic growth. Uh, the uh, uh, Obama campaign says the rich pay uh, too little uh, in taxes. Uh, the uh, role of government in protecting the poorest of uh, the United States is crucial, and that shouldn't be uh, diminished, and that uh, the, uh, the way ahead the way ahead 
is by uh, major government involvement of one way or another in rebuilding the American economy. It's, I think, not too simple to say uh, that Republicans tell the government to get out of the way and let the private sector uh, uh, energize the American economy. Uh, the Obama campaign says, we tried that with our banking system. Look what happened. We got out of the way, and look what happened with the banking system. Uh, but as you know, uh, most elections in most democr de democracies are decided by domestic issues, not foreign policy. Uh, and so it will be the, uh, the challenge of the, of the two candidates in the three debates they're going to have, the first one in a week, uh, to try to persuade the American people they have the best formula for reviving the American economy. Um, and most of the issues that I mentioned will certainly not come up in the first two debates. The third debate will be a foreign affairs debate, and uh, we'll see uh, there. And then uh, I'm almost done. Congress, the effect. Well, actually, uh, American presidents can do a lot of things without the Congress. Uh, for example, go to war in Afghanistan, <laughs> go to war in Iraq, just to pick two not trivial examples. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen, whether the Republicans will hold the House or win the Senate. I don't, I don't know what will happen. Uh, but I think the Congress, even more than when my good friend Ronan Sen was there, will be preoccupied with domestic issues. This is what their constituents care about. Uh, the House, as you said, or whoever said the House, uh, has to go every two years, and they're going to be judged, the House, on, well, how did they do in the two years from 2013-2014, and the Senate a third of that. So uh, um, I expect the U.S. Congress, uh, except for a few specific mem uh, members who are interested in foreign policy, to ignore most of the world unless it's terrorism against the United States and concentrate on uh, the domestic uh, agenda. Finally, and I'm, I'm right on time here, no, I'm not going to predict who the next president is going to be. As I say, I have my preference, which some of you would guess, but uh, I'm not going to predict it. Uh, uh, what I can say is, for those of you who follow, uh, that it appears today, with 40 days left, that uh, President Obama has some momentum, but everybody, uh, the real pros in this uh, line of work, uh, domestic politics, and I'm not one, uh, say that it's too early uh, to call the election, that the debates will matter a lot. The polling shows slight edges for Obama in some places, uh, but they may be ephemeral. So uh, I think uh, the, we're going to see in the last 40 days, this frenzied, and I use my words carefully, this frenzied uh, activity by the two campaigns. If you were sitting in Ohio or Florida or Wisconsin or Colorado, you'd want to throw your shoe through the television set because you'd see nothing but campaign commercials. Nothing but campaign commercials. It might drive you to turn off the television. So. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, and the great thing about uh, your democracy and ours is the people get to decide. The people get to decide. So thank you for all your good questions, and I'm perfectly content to let the American people decide. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, having an interaction with you is always very stimulating, and uh, I'm sure we have not been disappointed uh, this uh, evening. Uh, I was particularly happy to see that despite uh, your having uh, uh, told us in very, very, very categorical terms that you will not indulge in political astrology, you did at the end manage to skirt around a bit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, again, I would not like to summarize a very rich discussion that has taken place, but I think it is quite apparent that uh, 
you know, uh, as far as the elections are concerned and as far as the preoccupations of any administration coming in is concerned, it would be too messy. But I would also perhaps add that what happens in terms of the United States uh, economic recovery, uh, how soon it would bounce back, uh, will also have a very major impact on uh, its foreign uh, policy. And I think uh, many of us in India would be watching to see uh, how this, uh, the economic game plays itself out, the economic story uh, plays uh, itself out. Lastly, uh, I think it has been our experience that uh, there is far more oscillation as far as the political rhetoric is concerned and uh, ground reality in fact makes those oscillations smaller and smaller as you get closer to the ground and I perhaps uh, would imagine that that would be the case uh, in this, in this uh, uh, elections as well. So once again, thank you very much for being with us uh, this evening and giving us an opportunity to have the benefit of your views on this very important question. Thank you very much, the audience. I am told that there is tea. Uh